Hi, I'm Meredith Marr at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Today, we're discussing common skin care concerns and conditions in women of color with dermatologist, Dr. Marcia Driscoll. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Driscoll. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and be with you today. And thanks to all of you for watching. We invite you to leave your questions for Dr. Driscoll in the comment section below. And be sure to like this video to let us know you're tuning in. Dr. Driscoll, what are the most common skin concerns uh, you see in your practice for those patients with darker skin tone? So right now I chose three main concerns I have, you know, common problems that women of color may experience, but there are many more, but I'm going to focus on three today. And the first one is a mouthful is called hydradenitis aperitiva. And I'm going to, from here on, mention this or refer to this as HS. It's easier to, that way. And Meredith can also say HS and you'll all understand. And just really quickly, I'll elaborate later. This is a condition where, um, especially in women of color, they may develop boils in the underarm area and the abdomen, the breasts and the genital area and the buttocks that often drain a kind of odor, you know, odorous material is very disturbing physically and psychologically. That's my passion right now, but that's just one of, of many problems that we see in women of color. A second very common problem is um, problems with pigment or extra color, dark spots on the skin, especially on the face. And so I'm gonna to refer to that as pigmentary disorders or um, more specifically, there's one called melasma. The third area I'll just briefly go over that's a very, very common problem is hair loss. And I'm going to address one that causes scarring meaning um, that the hair follicle is destroyed and hair cannot be grown back. And this is called another mouthful, um, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. So we're gonna call that CCCA. So those are the three main disorders we're going to, to talk about today. Let's jump to the, the pigmentation disorder um, that you mentioned second, um, and mm -hmm. then we'll get into the other two. How does that condition develop? And um, I guess, how do you diagnose it as well? So there's a variety of reasons why women of color can see maybe dark patches on the face. One very common scenario would be a young woman uh, or an older woman comes in with acne and an acne bump may go away, but then it leaves behind a very disturbing dark spot. And that can be more disturbing than the acne itself sometimes because many of these spots may develop and the women are wondering how can I get rid of these dark spots and stop them from coming. Um, other reasons why um, a woman of color may have a pigmentary disorder is taking um, combination oral contraceptive pills or other types of contraceptive contraception that has hormones. Um, having a baby, a woman may develop something called mask of pregnancy. Having a certain inflammatory disorder like lupus or even taking a medication that makes you more sensitive to sun may cause some dark spots on the face. And this is very disturbing for women of color and how to address this darkening and how can, how can I get rid of it, basically. So what treatment options are there um, for women experiencing this condition? So in the case of acne, which is the most common scenario, the first goal is we want to stop the acne from coming because it's the acne really that's going, the acne process affects the, it sort of causes a disruption in the pigment cells. And in women of color or, or patients of color, they have more pigment, more melanin packed into their pigment cells, melanocytes, than patients that have lighter skin. So they have a lot of pigment packed into that cell. So that cell is damaged, that pigment is released and can deposit in the skin 
and therefore will cause more darkening of the skin than we may see in a patient of lighter skin tone. And so the first step is we need to have a skin specialist treat the acne. Once that's under control and then the pigment is the major problem, there are certain medications we can prescribe and also um, over-the-counter products like sunscreen that patients of color may not typically think about that this is an important part of therapy, but sunscreen can also be an important therapeutic um, measure in this, in this condition. We did have a question in advance from um, one of our uh, consumers on Facebook who asks, um, I have developed patches of dark skin on my chin. Sometimes it flakes and itches. I'm also looking for a sunscreen that doesn't make me look like a ghost. Uh, so going back to that sunscreen question, uh, what do you suggest that patients look for or avoid in a sunscreen? So dermatologists like to recommend the sunscreens that have the broadest coverage of the ultraviolet spectrum of all the air, there's, there's a, it's not worth going into a lot of detail, but just to say we want to have a good sunblock that blocks out the majority of the light, the ultraviolet light and visible light that we're exposed to that can cause darkening of the skin. And I agree with you, many of the best sunblocks that are called physical sunblockers that are ones used in babies. They often have the powder pink cap on them and they have zinc oxide or, and or titanium dioxide. When you put them on, you can look very white. And uh, one of my kids said I looked like a snowman once when I had this all over my body when I was going swimming. And it's true, they can look very white. There are some, there are some sunscreens that contain a tint um, and it's iron oxide. And that may be more pleasing to a lot of patients and it enhances the spectrum of the block because it also blocks out the visible light as well. So a tinted sunscreen goes on kind of a, you know, it, it, it often is pleasing in appearance that it almost looks like a makeup. And so that may be an alternative. I didn't want to go into specific brands, but maybe that can be a specific question I answer um, in chat, you know, privately. But there are sunscreens that are that contain a tint. Typically, they have iron oxide in them that may not look so white. And there are also certain brands that they've. Um, kind of made the molecules of sunscreen really small, they call it micronized, that it may, may, may not look quite as white. So it is hard, sort of hit and miss sometimes of trying a sunscreen. And dermatologists will say the best sunscreen is the one that you will wear. Because I can recommend a lot of sunscreens, but if you're not going to use it, then it's not really very useful. So you have to use it. And I can be, I don't want to give specific brands here, but we can, I can certainly put out a list of sunscreens that have tint that may be more pleasing um, cosmetically. Switching gears to um, alopecia, the hair loss condition that you mentioned early on, what causes that in women of color in particular, and how can we prevent it from happening? Well, a long time ago, they used to call this entity CCCA. They used to call it hot comb alopecia because it would stop at these um, flat irons, or I guess in the olden days, in my days, and maybe when I was young, they would call them hot combs. Or, uh, but that's not true. That's not what this is due to at all. The, there's a significant genetic component. It is not one's fault that one develops this type of hair loss. I just want to say briefly that it starts in the central part of the scalp and that it tends to spread outward and it can eventually, if not treated, become scarring. And that's a really important and devastating part of this problem is that you may not be able to regrow hair. 
So a genetic component is, is definitely a big part of this. But I also do want to mention that certain hairstyles that may pull the hair very tightly, um, like even extensions that are, are commonly used or certain hairstyles that may pull on the hair follicle may contribute, but I, I, but may not be the main factor, but maybe a contributing factor. So it's important to have, um, if one is to, to have braids or, or dreads or, or um, uh, you know, a type of hairstyle um, in particular, you just don't want it to be tightly pulling on the hair. Um, so that may be a component, but genetics seem to play a primary role. What are the treatment options for helping stimulate that new hair growth for patients with this type of alopecia? So if there's already some scarring that's occurred, we may not be able to get those damaged hair follicles to regrow hair, but what we can do is stop the process of scarring. And we do that by using anti-inflammation medications because we know that inflammation plays a role in this. And so there are medications that can be put on the scalp directly, or sometimes this sounds scary, but it really isn't injecting medications in the scalp. And even something that's an over-the-counter medication that seems to lengthen the growing phase of the hair cycle, that may also help. So seeing your skin doctor, we can offer therapies. We may not be able to do much for the hairs that are permanently lost, that are that where they're scarring, but we can help prevent um, the worsening of the condition. So seeing the skin specialist early is really important. And there are therapies and there are more therapies being, um, that are in research currently, but we have some standard therapies and we have more therapies to come. And are all of these treatment options covered by insurance? Not all. Um, but I would say that the majority of our patients are fortunate that we will look, we can look into that for the patient or the patient can call the insurance company themselves, but many of them are covered. Some of the newer therapies that are not as well established, I think I can, you know, maybe mentioned, um, might've heard of um, PRP um, or um, which is um, plasma enriched platelets, you know, there, there, are, uh, there, there are certain therapies that are experimental. Those are not covered by insurance, but the ones that are more, um, that are more established are typically going to be covered. And if they're not, we often can help a patients get prescription medications at a reduced price. So we're often, we're always the, trying to be the patient advocate and even if the insurance doesn't cover it, maybe we can find a way to obtain that medication that is a prescription at a reduced cost through certain programs. Lastly, of the three conditions you mentioned at the start of um, this Facebook Live, hydradenitis superativa. So during the month of June, there's a, a special awareness of this condition. Um, can you describe what it is exactly and what makes women of color have a higher propensity to develop it? So as I mentioned earlier on, this is a very um, physically and emotionally disturbing condition because patients get painful red boils that often first start at puberty. So they start can start very early in life and they typically affect skin fold areas. And so under the arms, under the breasts, and then in the genital area, the in for women, they can suffer that as well. And um, in the buttock area, and then also um, sometimes in the abdomen in skin folds. And so they start out as these painful boils 
And if not treated, they can cause, they can result in some drainage that is very disturbing to the patient. Um, some patients even have to resort to having a lot of dressings or even diapers to, to take up this drainage. So it's very disturbing. There can eventually be scarring of the, of the areas and then distortion or disfigurement of the genitalia, for example. So this is a progressive disease that is thought to have multiple um, factors involved in its cause. One is genetic, and that may explain why black women, or at least African-American women may be more predisposed as a gen genetic component, hormonal in that we know that three to four times um, as many women compared to men develop HS. So there's a hormonal component. There's an inflammatory component. We know that certain factors, certain proteins released in the body cause inflammation that contribute to this condition. And fourthly, we think bacteria play a role. We're not exactly sure, but we know that sometimes antibacterial agents or antibiotics are used in this condition and may help. So it's multifactorial. Why are, are women of color more often affected? It's probably both hormonal and genetic. So if a patient presents to you with this condition, maybe they had been previously diagnosed and maybe they haven't, um, what can they expect at a visit with you to go over the condition, how they can prevent it from further developing? Um, also, you know, as you're saying, there's a, a psychological, emotional component mm -hmm. to it too. How do you help these women uh, come to terms with this condition and also, you know, feel better about themselves with it? So one huge um, part of HS I haven't really discussed is that HS can be associated with a variety of, we call them comorbidities, other problems. One of them can be depression, anxiety. And I happen to be in a wonderful institution called the University of Maryland. And the University of Maryland has specialists in many areas. For example, women with HS may have um, obesity. They may have diabetes. They may develop um, high, hypertension. Um, high hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol and high fats in the blood. They may have significant pain. They may have um, depression and anxiety. And, and I, my role as part of the HS clinic is to make sure my patients have all the resources. So that if they need um, to be referred to pain management, we have some wonderful doctors in pain management that can deal with their pain. If they need help with their diabetes, I can refer them to someone that will help them in that area. Um, smoking is, a, is the strongest link. Interestingly, we don't even know why, but smoking is one of the strongest links to hydradenitis, but we don't really know why, you know, that why smoking adversely affects or predisposes to hydradenitis. We can plug you in with someone that you know, does a smoking cessation program. So we're fortunate enough at University of Maryland to help you with finding the right medical care. So in a clinic visit with me, I may ask, do you have a primary care physician? Because some patients don't. And I, I think that that's, you know, a key person in coordinating care. And so that I try to, um, I say plug in, but try to refer you to the right doctors that can help with all these problems. I have to sometimes push the patients and say, do you need help with pain? Because I'm not the pain specialist. I can find you someone that can, because I am in this wonderful place that has all these amazing people, amazing physicians and physician extenders that can help you with, this pro with these problems. What's the biggest myth or misconception about HS or any of the conditions that we discussed today? I think one, one comment or question that comes up on the internet a lot is, is this related to poor hygiene? And it is not at all. So I think that's one myth. So HS is not related to poor hygiene. And I also feel that 
patients, um, you know, if they are overweight, you know, they wonder again, if they're to blame for this. And I think it's a myth that they're not to blame for this. There are many components, like I said, genetic that play a role in, in this. So I also think it's a myth that, you know, it's, if, it, if, a, if someone, another physician may tell you it's just boils, it may not just be just boils. I mean, this is a, a progressive disease. There's not a cure for it, just to, to kind of emphasize that, but it can be controlled, especially if caught early. So a myth may be that if someone tells you, well, it's just a boil, you know, um, and, and someone can have one boil and it may just be that one time and they never develop it again. And that may not be something to worry about. But when someone has recurrent boils and skin folds, it should not be, you know, blown off, so to speak it needs to be addressed if it's a persistent recurrent problem. So a myth is it's just boils and you know doesn't have implications for other parts of your life. As we know, uh, this has been an under-investigated problem. And I think that it's why I'm so passionate about it is that I think that in general, um, you know, not to say physicians, but maybe the medical community for a long time, maybe it has not been aware of this condition. And maybe has not taken as seriously as we need to take it. Is there anything else you think our viewers should know that we haven't already covered today? I think that if you have any of the conditions that we talked about or other issues, the dermatologist is, you know, if you have skin issues, it's often best to see a skin specialist. Um, because really we are going to be the ones that have the most knowledge. You know, in medical school, most physicians do not get in their training a lot of dermatology. I have to say that University of Maryland is having a new curriculum starting in the fall. I'll be teaching a lot more dermatology, but let's just put it for right now, most doctors don't really have a lot of training in dermatology. It's not their fault, they just didn't have it. And so you need to see a skin specialist to get some of these issues diagnosed appropriately and treated promptly. Because as I've explained with several, at least with the hair loss and with, you know, hyd with HS, sometimes these conditions can be progressive and result in severe consequences if not diagnosed early. So I guess my main message is that if you have a skin problem, try to see a skin specialist so we can appropriately diagnose and treat. Before we wrap up here, speaking of seeing a skin specialist, what are some things a patient should consider when choosing a dermatologist, you know, to make them not feel judged or uncomfortable? You know, it's a kind of an intimate uh, appointment you would have with a physician that may be different than seeing, let's say, you know, an ophthalmologist or orthopedic doc. So what are some things that a patient should consider when choosing their own dermatologist? So dermatologists are actually, the skin is the, you know, we like to joke, the skin is the largest organ in the body. And it, it is, I mean, that's, it's true. And as part of our job, we frequently do head to toe exams looking at one's whole body for looking you know, skin, doing our skin cancer screening. So patients should not be embarrassed. For example, many patients with HS are embarrassed to take off their clothes. And, but we as dermatologists see, you know, all the skin, like all, all day long, we're doing a skin cancer screening. So you should not be fearful about us examining you because we, that's our job is to look at every part of the skin. And that means putting a gown on and looking at someone head to toe. And so that's what we, that's our job. And so we're used to having patients, you know, taking off their clothes to be examined thoroughly. So I don't want, we don't want anyone to feel that that's a problem with HS or any other skin problem that we're going to look at your skin and we want you to feel comfortable because we feel comfortable doing this all day long. So I, I hope that makes maybe one feel more reassured that this is part of what the skin doctor does. Um, and we, 
and again, the skin is the largest organ in the body. So we're used to looking at patients head to toe and to feel comfortable. How do you choose a skin specialist? Well, I'm going to be a little bit biased here and say that the University of Maryland is a good place to come. We have excellent doctors. Um, but certainly, if that's not accessible, the most accessible um, you know, uh, organization to, to seek out, um, that's, we understand that. But certainly, we would like, because University of Maryland does try to take care of our community, we try to serve our community. And our, I have to you know, put in a plug to say that we take most insurances. And so we try to be accessible um, to almost everyone. Uh, so I don't know if Meredith, that answers the question, but I think that, you know, I'm a little bit biased, of course, but I think University of Maryland would be a great place to start and because we do accept most insurances at the Department of Dermatology. We have this one appointment line and that is 667-214-1174. And that's the University of Maryland Department of Dermatology. We have two sites where we practice. And the first site is 419 West Redwood Street. And we're in suite 160. And also sometimes we see patients in suite 260. But the main professional building, there are many other physicians in that building is 419 West Redwood Street in Baltimore. And then our second location is 5890 Waterloo Road in Columbia, Maryland. But it's the same phone number for both locations.